Good evening, everybody. Oh, I might be a little loud. We'll just have to see how that turns out. They're headed for the door. If you get that's all right. We'll just see how it goes. I'm thankful for everybody that's here this evening. We praise the Lord for that. We praise God for the rain that He's given us. Um, we praise God for our family and fellowship, and um, we praise. We just praise God for who He is, not for things and not for. Um, uh, possessions, not for uh, things that he's done in our lives or healing, but we just praise God because he is the creator of all. So it uh, took me a while to see that sometimes, but I did. <clears throat> I wondered so aimless life filled with sin. I would let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger. Short. 
and help us, God, to, to work to be more like you and less like ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pizza night is next Wednesday. Bet y'all thought I'd forgotten that. Um, I'll, I'll try to remember a text. Um, but I'll try next Wednesday is pizza night. So y'all that did not make it for tonight, that you may be watching online, um, come have a piece of pizza and have some fellowship. I guarantee you, you'll have more fun here than you will at home. At least I believe you will. Let's see if I can do this.
intentionally wants to be fake or false, or even give the impression, the impression of being hypocritical. But we do so many times in our lives, and we do it mainly by our words and our actions. And that's what people judge. You know, we've all been, I don't know, sweet-talked or led astray or whatever by someone saying all the right words. And then we find out later by their actions that they didn't mean any of it, they didn't believe any of it, and a lot of it maybe wasn't even true. Uh, they, they were just trying to uh, trick us or use us or, or trying to uh, get to a mean. But God wants us to be bona fide. He wants us to use our life, be authentic in sharing with others the truth of the gospel. And we have to live it out as we speak it. But the problem is the speaking part. And we already talked to James 1.19. It said that we're to be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. But we're going to go into this a little bit farther in all. Uh, we're... How many of y'all know what a bit is that you put in a horse's mouth? The bit, you know, the bridle is the part that holds the, you know, the whole assembly. When you talk about a bridle, it's the headstall, the bit, and the reins. But just the bit. Bits are like fishing lures. Everybody's got the best one. Everyone's got the one that's going to fix your horse and all. But there's all kinds of bits because there's all kinds of horses. And when we break young horses, we use what we call an O-ring snap one. I wish I'd have brought one. It doesn't have any shanks on it. It doesn't have any leverage on it. So you can be nice and softer and gentle, and you can teach them. Because you can take a young horse, and you can take a bit, and not only can it be a tool, it can be a weapon. It can be something that really helps and teaches, or it can be something that really harms and hurts. Right? And it's the same with us and our words and our actions. It can be something that really edifies, and something that really lifts up, and something that really glorifies, or it can be something that is really harm and, and hurtful. And, and we have other bits. As, as horses mature, they're a little stronger. They give you more, a little more leverage. And you know, if you've got a really strong horse, you know, uh, my head horse is a pretty strong horse, but he's soft now. But he still needs a bit with a little bit of leverage on it because you know you need to be able to control him and, and, and be able to to do it. But there again. When that bit becomes bigger and harder, now it's got more tendency to be a weapon. It can be misused. And in the hands of the right person, that can make that horse produce and do wonderful things. In the hands of the wrong person, it can be so harmful. And it can be so hurtful. So we have to watch, too, that our words can be the same way. We can use words to edify and lift up and strengthen, or we can use words so they actually become a weapon. We've all said things in here that hurt somebody, haven't we? Or you might not want to admit it, but I know you've done it. And I mean, if you're over the age of four, I'm guaranteeing you have said something that, that has hurt someone. Uh, a lot of times, it's a split-second response out of anger or retaliation. It's really not even how we truly feel. Kids are really good about blurting out and calling other kids names. In retaliation to, to try and feel better. So we really have to watch how we're controlling our mouth and what we're doing with it. And the Bible is very clear about this. And the book of James says this, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Now that's a new King James Version. And what I have here in, in and my translation says that if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in the distress and refusing to be let the world corrupt us. But how many times have we responded a way that just like any other lost person? How many times have we spoken away, or we've heard somebody else speak in a way, and go, man, I can't believe that came out of their mouth. And I'm going to tell you what the world says when you do that. Yeah, that's one of churchgoers. That's one of Christians. See that? Yeah. That's one of them guys. You know, they think they're better. It says this verse is pretty straightforward. It speaks to all of us about controlling our mouth. 
We have to watch what we say. And it gets deeper. James was on in chapter 3. This is going to be the, the heart of it. So if you've got your Bible, we're in chapter 3. We're going to start off in verse 1. And he really gets into controlling our mouths. And he even uses the same metaphor. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we teach, <coughs> we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we could be perfect. And could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. And a, <clears throat> and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, <clears throat> even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is <clears throat> restless and evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and other times it curses those who have been made in God's image. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. You can't draw fresh water from a salty Spring. Now James isn't saying that we shouldn't become teachers or preachers and stuff like that. He just says, <coughs> excuse me, if we step up our game, people are watching what we say a lot closer. That people are going to try to uh, point out our faults and stuff. And he says in there that if we control our tongues that we would be perfect. How many of y'all Life would be better if you thought every time before you spoke. A long time before. <laughs> <laughs> Not giving it a reason once over, but actually thinking about it uh, before you speak. You know, and we have to understand that the power that is in the tongue, the Bible says we have the power to lift people up, and we have the power to destroy people. All of the words and what we say. Now, the, God, the Bible tells us to recognize and call out things that are against God. The sins that people commit. It doesn't tell us to go around beating them over the head. It doesn't tell us to go around and, and, and be judging how the, their salvation, uh, their, where their stance is with God. But it does say that we're to be telling them what the Bible says. And it does tell us that we should tell them in a way that glorifies God and that would actually show us and show them that we genuinely care. What is the biggest way to put power to your words? Your actions. Right. It, some things are easy to say, hard to do. We read God's Word all the time, don't we? As, as believers, we and we go to it for instruction, and we read it, and God's Word gives us instruction, and, and, and we understand it, and He tells us in love, and He tells us what the blessings and what the benefits and, 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 and what the problems will be if we don't do it, and all that, and we still struggle to put it into action. But I love what it said in verses in verse 3 and 4, that is, is, is that the tongue can actually be a weapon. I'm going to tell you what, there's people out there that's got a pretty good use of that weapon. And they can slice and dice people and tear people up. But that's not supposed to be us. Okay? When we speak the truth, the Bible says that we should speak in love. And James, when he starts connecting these dots, and he talks about this great big horse that's controlled by this little bit. So this great big ship that's controlled by a little rudder. We've had massive fires here in Texas over the last couple of weeks. All started by little sparks. 
And I'm going to tell you, you can say something about someone to someone else, and that starts to travel, and the flame that it can get going can burn down friendships, can burn down family relationships, can burn, and one of the great things I hate about texting is no one understands the context in which you said something. They get to perceive the way it was said. You might have been joking, they think you were serious. Next thing you know, you're not speaking to someone you've known to for 20 years. And it was all over some words. <coughs> I think I told you all, I've not, I, I told a lot of you, I've said this many times about this, uh, this dad that had trouble with his son always saying things, mean things to people. So he made a deal with his son. He said, I'm going to tell you what you want to do. The son wanted to stop. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to work on it. And every day you go to school, if you say something mean about someone, if you say something hurtful to your brothers or your sisters or your mom or me or something, we're going to come out here and you're going to put a nail in the board of this fence. So as this young man started doing this, he started realizing as these nails started increasing and more and more of them was there, he decided that he didn't want to do that anymore. That he was actually going to told his dad, he said, I, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to say anything mean. I don't, I, I don't want all the nails in the board. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do then. Every day that you don't do it, we'll take a nail out of the board. So as time went on, finally they got to the point where there was no more nails in the board. And the young man was so happy, he went and told Dad, he said, Dad, look, there's no nails in the board. And you know what his dad said? Look at that board. Look at all the holes in that board that could never be filled up. And that's just like our words. Our words can hurt, and they leave holes, and they leave scars. And Paul goes on to say, or James goes on to say that, we praise God and we read the scripture and we sing hymns to God and then we turn around and cuss the people that God loves. And I hear people say, well, you know, I'm just talking about, you know, they're not a church person. They're not, they're not. It says people made in the image of God. It didn't say just believers. It didn't say you got to talk good about believers and you can cuss the lost world. That's not what it said. It doesn't say if the guy's got a fish on the back of his bumper, you can't cuss him when he cuts you off. But if he got no fish or no cross hanging from the windshield, he's fair game. That's not what it says. It says that we should love what God loves. That we should be able to take our tongue and glorify and edify and lift up the things that God does. we got to be careful that this thing can get away from us. We can start the tiniest little fire. How many of y'all been around teenage girls? How many of y'all had a drama problem with teenage girls? It all starts with the word. Do you know what I heard in school? Do you know what so-and-so said? Their life is disrupted and terrible. I can never go to school again. Yeah. We're going to have to move, mom and dad. So-and-so said this or so-and-so said that. We can be so hurt by words, but yet we're not very controlling of the words in which we say. Why is that? We feel justified in being able to express what we want to express. But you know what? The person that said those words that made you mad felt justified in the words that they wanted to use and they used to express it. James says we have to be careful where our mouth steers us. Has your mouth ever got you in trouble? Yeah. Yeah. It, it just, you know, sometimes, you know, that whole thing thing, right, Bobby? Yeah. Yeah. It just spewed out. And you ever thought to myself, man, I just say that out loud? Did that thing actually come out of my mouth? I know I was thinking it. I can't believe that I said it. How about someone that <coughs> you really as mature as a Christian would say something. And you would say something like, I can't believe they said that. It's amazing how much focus can be on our words. How much focus can be on what we say. So just think about that. 
How much damage we can do. How much we can tear down. How much pain that we can cause. How much hurt we can cause. Let's flip that around. How much good can we do? How much pain can we heal? How much grace and mercy can we show? How about the compassion that we can give? You know, the Bible says, there's a verse in, in, in Proverbs that says that we should spur one another on. I always like the calendar version. Spur one another on to good works. How do you encourage someone to do better? To do better? It's surely not by belittling them or beating them over the head. How do you, you encourage someone to quit drinking? Uh, to seek out God. How do we encourage someone? We do that with good words is how we lift up and edify. You know, and it's funny because when Jesus was ever scolding anybody in, in the New Testament, 90% of the time he was talking about the religious people. Did you know that? 90% of the time he was talking about the church people. Does that not bother anybody? <laughs> That when, when our Lord and Savior, when God in the flesh was walking this earth, when he was upset, he was not upset at all the sinners. He was not upset with all the Gentiles. He was not set upset with all the lost people. He was set upset with all the religious people. And it was about the things that they were saying. So we have to be careful. How many of y'all have ever been to a circus? You ever wonder how they get those elephants to do the things that they do? Or the lions? How many of y'all would like to get into a cage of lions? Oh, you would not. <laughs> My wife's up here, I would, I would. Yeah, if they were this big. <laughs> that was in Cheyenne, Wyoming one time. Uh, one of the little things they had up there for the rodeo week so they had people that had tiger and lion cubs and you could go in there and sit down and, and I mean they were like young but they weren't digital <laughs> they were pretty good size I think they were just a few months old but they were like you know like dogs size anyway you know and they were cool and cuddly and all and everybody was having a good time and all and then you walk around behind the cover and there's Dan's mom <laughs> and how did someone ever tame them? Taming lions and bears. I was watching on uh, Facebook. I don't get on there much anymore. But a lady was teaching the bear to play catch. Have you all seen that? Bear standing up. She'd throw at the ball. And bear, but bear would catch it and get it all the way around. And he'd push it back. And I'm thinking, how do you do that? And the Bible says in here, James tells us that it's easier to tame a lion than our tongue. It's easier to tame a bear, a big old black bear, to play catch, than to get control of this thing that's between our teeth. So James is not telling us this is an impossible task. James is telling us this is something that's going to take a lot of work. Because when they train a lion, it didn't happen overnight. When they train a bear, it didn't happen overnight. When they train an elephant, they have, it, it's amazing. Because how many of y'all have been to a, 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 a 4 H show or whatever watching? They got the pigs in the pen. They got the little sticks and they tap and all. And I can see that working with a pig. But that's about the same method these guys use with an elephant. I'm thinking tapping about a four-ton elephant with a pound and a half stick really doesn't have a whole lot of effect on it. But the elephant's got to the point where he wants to obey and wants to follow. And that's where we got to get if we want to tame our tongue. We got to get to a point where we want to obey and want to follow. Is it going to be hard? Absolutely. Even if you have a willing animal, if you have a, a willing horse, if you have a, a willing lion, if you have a willing, it takes time and a lot of work and a lot of effort. And I'm sure there's times that they mess up. And, you know, I, I would love to be said talk with a, a trainer. When I, I was going back over the sermon again and thinking about talking with a trainer. How many times they've been scratched? 
by a lion and training a lion. How many times have they actually been bitten by a lion and training a lion? Because I'm sure it happens. You know what I mean? I'm sure that that happens. So there's setbacks and there's stories, and that's what we're going to have. We're going to have times, you know, when we slip up and, and when we mess up. And, you know, James says that we can't tame it, we can't be perfect, but we got to be wanting to. We got to be wanting to try to change it. We got to be wanting to take the time and work on it. We got to be willing to put time in it. When we start to break a horse, we ride them every day. When they come two years old and they get broke for 90 days, they're worked on every day. Every day they're taken out of their stall. Every day they're saddled. Every day they're tied to the fence. Every day they're putting a round pen in order. Every day they get on and ride them. They work at it every day. Why? Because one day a week will not work. It just won't work. Once in a while, watching our tongue once in a while, putting a little effort into it, if it's something this hard, it's going to take a lot of thick. I mean, James told us our tongue is really tough. <clears throat> we can burn down fort. We can burn down families. We can burn down lives. We can disrupt so many things with our speech. It's going to take time to get to the point where we are using it as a tool to glorify and edify God and to lift people up and encourage people who are not using it as a weapon to tear down. So James says, this is something that you're going to have to work on. This is something that we're going to have to put forward. You know, he said, this is worse than trying to train a grizzly bear. How many people have ever read a story about someone that tried to domesticate a wolf? You ever, you ever look at that stuff at all? I, I've seen some documentaries on it. You know what? It's never been successful long term. They grow up, they even have them as cubs when they've been abandoned and they've raised them and they've nursed them. But the instinct of the wolf is always in the wolf. So what's that tell us about our sin nature? The instinct of the wolf is always in the wolf. So it's going to be a battle. We've got to be consciously thinking before we're speaking. We've got to constantly be worried about what we're saying. We've all said it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. And we want that to be the healing process, don't we? We want that to fix it. How many times has someone said something to you and they said, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean that and it was completely fixed healing you forgot it forever? I'm betting none. This has to be something that we work on. This has to be something that we invest our time in. This something has to, in order to do this, we have to be aware. We have to be aware of it. We have to be conscious. We have to be focused. Because it will not just happen. James said this is something that's really going to take work. Let me end you with this. This is in Psalm 141. It says, Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give an ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. David knew that he couldn't do it. David knew that he he's had enough outbursts. I have no idea how old he was when he wrote that. He's had enough outbursts. He's done enough things. He's done enough damage. <coughs> He set enough fires, Bobby, with his mouth and his tongue that he knew that he couldn't do it. So he asked God, God, I want you to set a guard. I want you to intervene. When the wolf in me tries to come out, when the sinner in me tries to come out, I need you to intervene. And the biggest thing I need you to do is shut my mouth before I say something that I don't mean. Before I do damage to your kingdom. And this is what he says. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I want you to shut it. But this is going to be an ongoing thing. 
Man, at one time, set it and forget it. Ain't like that cooking show, just set it and forget it. And it'll spit out a perfectly roasted turkey. He said, God, I need you to guard it, and I need you to be watching. And I need you to be there and be conscious of it. And I need to be aware of God's spirit. Lord, I want you to show me and help me and guard me and help me keep my mouth under control. You know how much power we have, how much good we can do? How much many times that we've all had a unruly, snotty, irritable cashier? And I wonder how many times we could have changed their day with an edifying word. With an uplifting encouragement. Man, you've had a rough day? I'm sure they'll tell you. <laughs> Can I pray for you? God loves you. Amen. We don't do that, though. But me and my partner, me and my wife, and walk to a car all the way talking about how rude you bad you are. We can use many words to describe her faults and her failures, but yet we were unwilling to give one word or two words that would lift her up and encourage her. But we have great opportunity every day to use our mouth as, as a tool for Christ. God wants us to go out and share the gospel. How do we share it? We share with our mouth, and we, you know, I had a guy tell me, he says, you know, we're to be uh, witnesses for God every day, and sometimes we have to use words. But we have opportunities every day to use this thing that God has given us to glorify Him, to bring glory to Him, or to tear down. It would be my prayer if we study this book of James and we look at this and James is focusing on how unruly our mouths are and how bad our words can be, the things that can happen, that maybe we can have the prayer of David. Maybe when we go to bed tonight, we can say, God, I want you to put a guard over my mouth. Lord, I pray that tomorrow morning when I get up that you would keep watch over the things that I say. You ever said something in private that you wouldn't say in public? There is said something to one person in a small group that you wouldn't announce from the pulpit or, or, or out loud to a group of people. So let's look at it like this. If God's going to set a watch over our lips, before we speak, remember, God is watching. Before you go to say what you're going to say, understand God is watching. Because when you ask God to put a watch over your mouth, He will. And He's going to expect you to use it in a way that glorifies Him. And I think the biggest thing that would help us is if we would just say, hmm, if Jesus was standing here, is that what I, what I would have said? Because if it's not, you shouldn't have said it at all. Father, James teaches us that this is a battle, a struggle that no man can accomplish. David knew this, and he cried out to you, set a guard over my tongue and watch over my lips. Father, guard my mouth and watch my lips. Keep me, Lord, from using it as a weapon. Help me to use it as a tool. Father, I want to pray that we cry out that same prayer. That we start to think every time that you are watching. I want you to watch over my mouth. I want you to watch, set a guard over it. I want you to be looking upon it. And I don't want to never forget that you're watching. Lord, let me understand before I speak that you are watching. And Father, I just pray that we would take this to heart, that we would start to have this desire to use this thing that you've given us as a tool to lift you up, to edify others, and to point people to your son. That we would stop using it as a weapon. That we would stop using it in a way that turns people away. Father, I ask now that you watch over us when we leave this place. And I pray that you would keep us and watch over us. <clears throat> Return us back to this place where we can worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um. <clears throat>
JJ's kind of message reminded me of a time, you know, I've grown, I pray since then, and I know that I had grown some before then. Some poor guy, uh, Denise could tell me where, I think it was Burger King. Um, I don't even remember what they did, but I'm going to tell you what, I did not do any work for the kingdom at that point, for that, for that, for that person. And, and as we got back over to the table and sat down, God convicted my heart and I could not feel the hole that I made um, with the words that I used. But God convicted my heart to go and tell that person that I was, um, that that was not the way God would have expected me to act. And that is, I did not in any way um, that I was wrong. Basically that I was wrong to have said what I said and done the way, done it the way I did it. And um, I think all of us, like J.J. said, has, have said those things and I can guarantee you, I've said things before I thought that um, I was didn't take the other person's feelings about something or emotions about something into account before I ever said it. I would have said some things if Jesus was sitting there. But you know, I didn't take into account how the other person was thinking. And I think that so many times that's what gets us to is we're not thinking about the other person. We're just thinking about, okay, this is what I'm going to say. It pops right out there. And as soon as it popped out, um, you're convicted to know that it's wrong. So that I pray that um, each one of us, well, I pray, that, I pray for me that God would set a guard over my mouth. See, y'all know I use it quite a bit. See, there you go. <laughs> so uh, I just pray that God would help me to use my mouth to glorify Him. Another thing that was helpful um, at a time in my life is uh, to have a, an accountability person to sit there and um, like I had to pay up every time I did something or said something that I really wasn't supposed to say. And it started costing. Um, it's kind of like putting those holes in that fence. Um, you know, you start taking dollars out of your pocket when you say a word you shouldn't. Um, it kind of brings home that those words aren't needed, that those words are pointless. Anyway, I'll let you come for another two sermons. Y'all just came for one. I'm assuming. <laughs> Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. Once upon a time there lived a man and his name was Hezekiah. He walked with God both day and night, but he didn't want to die. He prayed, oh Lord, please let me live. Death is close, I know. God fell on Well, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. So I'm on for the day when I have new birth. Still a love living here on your earth. Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die. Jesus lived here on this earth, he knew his father's plan. He knew that he must give his life to save the soul of man. But you just did betray him. Father heard him cry. He was brave until the end, but he didn't want to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die. Well, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. So I long for the day when I have new birth. Still a love living here on your earth. Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die. Bye. Uh -huh.
guess that's the way I think a lot of people view it. I do am so thankful that everybody was here this evening. Um, I'm thankful that you spent some time together. We got to spend some time together. I pray to see you all Sunday, and I pray that next Wednesday that if you ain't here, come get some pizza. If you are here, come get two pieces. And uh, just remember that there's more grace in Jesus than there is sin in us. And you all have a good night.